So in this one, I'm going to break down the same project we already modeled in Rhino. But this time, it's done entirely in Grasshopper. And along the way, you'll see exactly what changed. I'll add a few comparison clips from the Rhino modeling here, in case you're only following the Grasshopper side. This is the kind of video where you open up both this one and the manual version side by side to experience the full process from two different approaches. There are timestamps in the script which show you where each part of this Grasshopper version lines up with the manual one. All right, let's start. In the manual modeling, what we did in the first minute and a half was create a spiral using the spiral command in Rhino and set its size. Now let's build that in Grasshopper. We'll use the spiral component. It gives us a default spiral aligned along the X axis. To make it vertical, I'm connecting a unit Z vector as the axis. Pitch controls the vertical stretch. I'll set it to six meters. Turn count, 2.5. Radius, 7.5 for R1 and 1.5 for R2. Basically, all these inputs match the dimensions we used in the Rhino version. That's it for the first part. The spiral is done. All right, next part. What we did was take the spiral, extract the subcurve, and then offset that curve. But since the offset followed the same direction as the original spiral, we flipped it by scaling in Z by negative one and moved it down to the ground floor. First, we'll extract a subcurve. Just like in Rhino, we'll use the subcurve component and right click the curve input and choose reparameterize. This makes the domain predictable. Instead of using unknown values like 37 to 92, it resets the range to zero to one. In this example, the domain is set from 0 0.1 to 0 0.299, which gives us a percentage slice of the curve. You can tweak these values to target a different segment, just stay within the zero to one range. I'll leave it like that for now. Next step is offsetting this section. Same logic as Rhino. We use the offset curve component and set the offset distance. Now, if your curve isn't planar, Grasshopper will throw an error. That's because you need to define an offset plane if it's not planar. So I'll just use the XY plane as the offset in plane. That fixes it. Now we've got our offset curve, but like before, we need to flip it vertically. To do that, we use scale non-uniform, setting scaling in Z to negative one. But first, we need a base plane. So first, we create a bounding box around the curve, then extract its center. To get that center point, we use the area component and use the centroid. It might seem odd to use area for a box, but it still gives us the center of the bounding box, and that's all we need. You could also use volume, and it would give the same point in this case. That point gets automatically converted into an XY plane at the same origin, which we then use as the base plane for the vertical flip. Here's before and here's after. You can see it's flipped. Now we need to move that flipped piece down to the ground. As you might guess, we use the move component, but we have to define a custom direction and magnitude for it basically a translation vector. We'll set that up using a couple of helper components. First, we extract the start and end points from the curve. The end point tells us how far above the ground it is. We deconstruct that point into X, Y, Z coordinates and use the Z value to see how high the curve sits. Then we use that value to move the entire curve downward in the negative Z direction. So it sits flush with the ground. Here's before and after. That lines up perfectly. So the setup should look something like this now. I'll bring both results together for the next step. All right, now that's done, let's move on. The next thing we need to do is blend this section of the curve back to the spiral. We're connecting from the bottom one back to the top. If you remember the Rhino tutorial, we use the blend curve command there. Same idea here we'll use the blend curve component too. Input A takes the original spiral curve, the one we started with. Input B takes the offset and flipped curve, the section we prepared earlier. We can control the blending using the bulge factor. Just tweak the numbers until it looks right. Now we have three curves, the spiral, the base, and the blended middle. 
all of those get merged into one output for the next step. In the Rhino version, we just joined all the curves, rebuild the curve and offset it in both directions. Then from those two offset curves, we made a lofted surface. Now let's do that part in Grasshopper. We'll start by joining the curves together, unflattening them first so they combine into one curve. And then we pass it to the Regaled Curve component. That makes the control points evenly distributed, which helps us get a regular spacing for the stairs. We can check that by just connecting the control points. Here, you can literally see there are no points on this side. But after rebuilding, the control points get distributed more proportionally. Next up, we're offsetting this on both sides. To preserve the control points, I'm using the offset curve loose. The regular offset usually messes that up. We'd lose the rebuilt control points completely. See here? The offset doesn't really know which point to use, so just like before, we'll set the XY plane as the base. Right now, it only offsets in one direction, so we need both a positive and a negative value. What I'm doing here is taking one value and merging it with its negative. That gives us two equal but opposite values, which means we get two offset curves, one on each side. Now that we've got that, we loft them, and that gives us a single fused surface. But in the manual version, those divisions came from the sub D loft. Around the 12 minute mark, we use those wireframes to create the stair blocks. Here in Grasshopper, the regular loft just gives us a flat surface. We don't have a sub D loft here. So here's the trick. We set the rebuild to greater one. That forces it to treat each control point as a hard corner, which gives us those clean divisions. We end up with a breadth, made of small segmented surfaces. From there, we pass it into a simple mesh component and then into sub D from mesh. This converts each face into quads, four-sided faces, which gives us a predictable sub D result. Now, if we preview both side by side, you'll notice the sub D sits inside the control polygon. It doesn't touch the corners directly like a nerve surface would. To fix that, we've got this option to invert the interpolation, so it pushes toward the corners instead. But that creates this kind of blobby rounding, which we don't want. So we'll crease the corners instead, just choose Crease at Mesh Corners, and that sharpens up the corners. All right, next step. In this part, the slope's way too steep and the spacing isn't consistent. Back then, we just selected control points along the curve and ran the smooth command over and over, probably like 200 times until the spacing looked right. Now in Grasshopper, we'll do something similar, but the setup's a bit different. Let's rebuild that same effect here. We're going to apply the smoothing step between rebuild and offset. So I'll double click here to add a relay and expand it to give us a bit more breathing room. Now we've got this setup. First, we extract the control points using the control points component then rebuild with polyline. If we just place it in between, it basically does nothing. It grabs the points and recreates the same curve. But now we've got direct access to those points passing through and that's what we'll use to smooth it. All right, let's add one more level to this. We'll bring in split list and combine it with merge. This doesn't change the final output either, but it lets us split the control points into two separate lists and in between, we can apply different effects separately for each output. You can control the split using this index value, and after that, we just merge them back and send it through. Basically, we're deciding which side goes to which output so we can manipulate list B separately. Now in this part, we're adding one more step. We'll use deconstruct point and construct point, and just like before, this won't change the output depth. We're extracting the X, Y, and Z values, then building the point back again. But here's the trick. In the middle, we get control over the Z values. That's the part that's causing the uneven slope. So we're going to even them out using the blur numbers component. It works just like blur attribute. It smooths values by averaging them with their neighbors multiple times based on the iteration count. Let me show you what that means. I'm gonna use quick graph to visualize the changes. Before blur, the Z values were rising unevenly, kind of a bump in the middle. After blow, you can see it smooths out nicely. 
you can control how smooth by adjusting the iterations. So now we can replace those evenly distributed values as our z coordinates. That evens out the slope, but if you look here, there are some gaps. See how the y changes to a dashed line? That means it's creating branches when merging. This usually happens with components that have multiple inputs. For example, deconstruct point only takes one input, so the path stays the same. But blur numbers can accept another list as input, and that's when it tries to keep a consistent structure by adding zeros. Since we don't need that here, we can use Verify to clean it up. Another way is just simply flatten it right here. And here's what the new setup looks like. This is basically a one-to-one -one version of what we did manually to smooth things out. In the Rhino model, we did the same thing. When we chose to lock the X and Y coordinates after selecting the control points, we were basically filtering out movement in those directions. Same idea here, we go deeper by deconstructing and reconstructing until we reach the point coordinates. Then isolate the Z values and smooth them out. All right, let's move to the next step. This is where we create the base stair block zone, kind of like a 10 step base made out of repeating segments. Back in the Rhino version, around the 12 to 20 minute mark, we extracted the wireframes from the sub D and generated the stair blocks from them. We could have maybe used something like Surface Morph to speed it up, but here in Grasshopper, it's much easier. Let me show you. So we start with our sub D result and we pass it into a component that breaks it down into separate faces, deconstruct breadth. Each sub D polygon gets turned into a single surface. Then we move those faces up, I'll set the height to 0.19 meters, which represents the standard stair riser height according to the IRC. Now the segments we see are separate surfaces, but they're still inclined. We want to make the top of each surface flat so it's steppable. To do that, we extract the corner points of each face using the discontinuity component. Each surface has four corners. From those corners, we need to find the highest one, the point with the maximum Z value. We pass the corners through deconstruct point to extract the X, Y, and Z values, then sort them by Z height. That gives us the lowest point first and the highest one last. So we either reverse the list or simply grab index negative one using list item. That highest point becomes the origin of a new XY plane. One thing to watch out for here, we've got dashed wires and the top part isn't matching. So I'll just flatten it after the XY plane to fix the structure. That gives us our horizontal stair blocks. You can see the difference here. This is the before and this is after. It turns that inclined spiral into a series of flat, step-like structures. Now each block has a flat top, something you can actually step on. Next, we're going to turn these into solids. We've got the original spiral surfaces and the flat rises, and we'll use those to create the solid blocks. Here's the setup, I'll break it down in a second. Just in a few quick steps, we've got working stairs. First, we take the two surfaces the flat top and the original face. Make sure to graft both inputs so the loft happens between the correct surface pairs. That gives us the side geometry of each stair block. Even though loft usually works with curves, it handles this by automatically extracting the edges from each surface and using them as loft curves. You could get the same result by explicitly passing the surfaces through boundary or curve components, but here, it just does that internally. After that, we merge the lofted side with the top and bottom surfaces. Make sure to simplify both inputs, then we use brep join to connect the faces and pass the result into solid union to combine them into one closed solid. Make sure to flatten the output from brep join before running solid union. That keeps everything clean and watertight. And we give it a custom preview to see it clearly. All right, let's keep going. From here on out, things get a lot simpler, mostly just geometry tweaking. So the next part is creating those spiral sidewalls that wrap around the stair blocks. In the Rhino version, we just offset both spiral curves and extruded them with some thickness to build the sidewalls. Let's go ahead and recreate that in Grasshopper. Here's the setup, let me explain what's happening. First, we take both offset curves. Since they're polylines, we use discontinuity to get the corner points, then pass them through NURBS curve to smooth them out. 
That way, when we extrude, we get clean, continuous surfaces instead of jagged edges. I set the extrusion to about 2 meters to match the vertical scale of the side walls. Then we gave it some thickness using offset surface. This one's from the Pufferfish plugin. Here are all the plugins we used from this point onward and how to install them. Just type package manager into Rhino, search for Pufferfish and install it. I'm using version 3 here. Next is LaunchBox. Same idea, search, select, install. And finally, Waverbird, search for it and hit install as well. After installing everything, make sure to restart Rhino so all the plugins load correctly. So now we've got the offset thickness added and a custom preview applied. It should look something like this. The next part is the curtain paneling system. Here, we're building the curtain panel system that sits right on top of the wall. In the manual version, we just extracted some ISO curves from the spiral, extruded them upward, and used those as the framework for the curtain system. We have the same equivalent setup here. First, we've taken one of the spiral curves we created earlier using list item and moved it up in the Z direction using the same height we used earlier when extruding the spiral walls, but places it right at the top edge. From there, we're not using the entire spiral, just a part of it. So we've added a subcurve component to isolate the section, just like we did earlier. Now you'll notice some of these extrusions go past the top of the spiral wall. We need to clamp them down. Basically, we want to limit the height, so none of the panels extend above the helical roof. Here, we take the control points from the curve and use do construct point to access their x, y, and z values. Then we recreate the points and pass them back into a NURBS curve. But in the middle, we use a minimum component to clamp the z value. That way, even if a point tries to rise too high, it stops at a fixed threshold. And those points will help us create the NURBS curve again and set up the extrusion. Now, in this section, we're going to apply panels and frames. We take that new surface and pass it into LaunchBox quad panels. This creates a grid of quads. Then we pass that into Simple Mesh which gives us a mesh we can use. From there, WaveBird's picture frame and mesh window components are used to generate the panels and frames. We apply thickness using offset mesh, one positive and one negative value to offset in both directions. You can apply the same thickness logic to the mesh window output as well. Now for the last part, we'll repeat the curtain logic on a different area of the model. We use subcurve again to extract a section of that curve, project it down to the ground, and then create a loft between the projected curve and the original. Now, in this section, we'll apply the same paneling setup. We can just copy the previous setup and apply it right here. And that's it. Here's how the final mode setup looks. Let us know which version felt easier or more time saving. The manual Rhino approach or the grasshopper. If you haven't seen the Rhino version, you can watch it here and you'll notice the difference right away. And that's it for this video. If you want the full Grasshopper file along with other custom scripts, they're available on Patreon. Thanks for watching. If you like this kind of breakdown, you'll definitely enjoy the next one. See you there.